Judge Greener. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss these and congratulate the trialists. And I know I'm the only thing standing between you and asking questions, so I'll, I'll try and get the, through this pretty quickly. Um, I think that uh, one of the key things to underscore is that we're the, the rising costs of medical care make it very pertinent for us to evaluate the economic outcomes of, uh, of uh, therapies such as we've heard today and that the randomized trials really are the best ways to compare these um, therapies and that you can do a cost effectiveness analysis alongside a randomized trial. But we always have to be mindful of the fact that uh, there's design considerations and how the trials were put together. The experiment may be a little different than what happens in the real world. And so there's always uh, some issues about generalizability of these uh, results. So uh, I will go through each one of these trials in turn. Um, the Seaport trial economics uh, you heard uh, today uh, was uh, 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 clinically uh, not inferior, uh, and the costs were a little bit higher in the sites without surgery uh, than the sites with surgery. Um, one of the questions that I had in looking at this, and I, and I know that the, uh, the, uh, uh, I was working off the last bunch of slides and not the most recent ones, is the question here is really about whether um, a lot of the things are due to uh, the surgery being present on site or not, or whether it's the volume of the sites that are doing the PCI that is the crucial thing. Uh, if we have a low volume site, uh, they may have higher costs and higher adverse uh, events. Um, uh, the, whenever you do something in higher volumes, you're more efficient economically and you may actually do a little bit better job. Um, so that's a very interesting possibility about here that, that the issue actually may not be whether surgery is present on site, but really how many uh, cases are being done uh, in, the, um, in the centers. But the other side of that is that these centers are there uh, not only doing these elective procedures, but they're also doing emergency procedures. So anything that we are worrying about policy has to take into account the fact that they, we wanna, may want to have these uh, sites available for doing emergency procedures as well as such as for patients with an acute MI. So the policy implications of this is, are a little bit uh, more tricky because uh, they're, they're, follow, they're uh, providing uh, care for all, all kinds of patients, not just the kind that were put into the trial. Um, the TACT quality of life study, uh, you just uh, heard the, the clinical results and the uh, and the quality of life results, uh, there are no cost data available yet from this trial. So there's not really an economic component to this. Uh, I found the primary endpoint difference to be pretty surprising. Uh, and uh, obviously, the significance level was not high. It was, uh, it was uh, somewhat borderline, but it was significant. Um, there were small effects on quality of life, but they were not significant. And so the results of the quality of life trial don't actually support the main outcome uh, part. It, it's hard to put all of these data together from the various pieces of the trial. And I think because the trial results were somewhat unexpected, uh, we need to kind of go into this in further detail. And, and I certainly think we need to have some confirmation. But nevertheless, uh, the trial results are very provocative. Finally, uh, on the cost effectiveness uh, in the Freedom trial, uh, patients who were assigned to bypass surgery had lower five-year mortality. Um, they did have a higher initial cost, uh, but that cost difference narrowed over the five years of follow-up. Now, one of the key things for in terms of interpretation is to say that whenever you do a cost-effectiveness analysis in a trial, especially a trial like of surgery, um, we have a chance to see all of the costs up front during the trial period but the full benefits of the uh, treatment may not be seen during the trial period. And this is particularly so in freedom. Uh, because the costs, of the uh, survival curves didn't separate until late, um, many patients, uh, there were many patients who died here, but we only saw part of their uh, life expectancy loss during the trial. So the authors did a, a projection of this, and I want to underscore that the most important part of this projection is not some fancy predictions about the future, but a full accounting of what actually happened to the patients that we observed. In other words, the patients that lost, uh, that, that, who died during the trial, uh, if I did just a, a very back of the envelope calculation and said that each one of these uh, people would have lived another 12 years, uh, you can calculate that uh, uh, the cost effectiveness ratio during the trial would be much more favorable uh, than it was out at, uh, at the long term. 
projection. So the, the cost effectiveness results, I think, are quite solid. They're, they're basically uh, saying that the patients, uh, the, the observed differences in, uh, in survival that were seen in the trial, uh, coupled with the uh, cost difference of about $3,600, makes it look like a very economically attractive um, uh, therapy for patients who have diabetes. And uh, that's my last slide, and I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you.